I view my clients as my friends. Um, and in doing so, I tell them how I care about them, what I want to see for them, and really spend time as to what their goals are. So a lot of what I do is explain how whatever choice they make, as long as it's an educated and informed choice, then they're making the right choice. Nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody can predict precisely what will happen. And as long as they're comfortable at this moment in time that it's the smart decision for them, then they should never second guess and never make that choice as a result of fear. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Answering Legal's Everything Except the Law podcast. I am your host, Nick Worker. If this is your first time tuning in, this is the podcast where we share expert advice on all the parts of running a law firm that attorneys weren't exactly trained for back in law school. Now, joining me for this episode is Andrew Finkelstein. Uh, and Andrew is a Andrew is an accomplished litigator representing victims in wrongful death and catastrophic personal injury cases. Additionally, he teaches advanced trial practices at an online trial school and has a new book out in which he tells his clients incredible stories of tragedy and recovery. We're going to be talking about it all on today's show. Andrew, thank you for making time for us today. Hey, my pleasure. Happy to be here. Well, um, so just to get started, can you tell me and, and the audience a little bit about your, your legal background and, and share with us some of your career highlights so far? Started uh, graduating law school, Brooklyn Law School, 1991, joined my dad's firm. And uh, at that point in time, when I joined his firm, wasn't too sure I actually wanted to practice law. But shortly after that, I realized that I could accomplish all of my business objectives right in the law firm. When I started, it was a, a one office, uh, about 25 lawyer firm. And since then, it's grown to, I think we're up to about 20 offices, five law firms, and about 300 or so total staff about of which 90 or so are lawyers and uh, um, personally i litigated almost every type of of injury type of case from um, complex uh, pharmaceutical cases to uh, product liability cases to car crash fall down construction site uh, ranging in injuries from uh, certainly in the beginning of my career was uh, less significant injuries, but still significant to my client through uh, up into wrongful death cases, amputation cases, um, individuals that have become blind, a uh, whole, whole host and range of catastrophic injuries. And the book I wrote is entitled, I Hope We Never Meet, because if we meet, that means, and I'm talking to you professionally, you don't want to be speaking to me. It just means you or a close family member has been uh, really badly hurt. Uh, so, yeah, you mentioned the book. I, and listen, I hope that whoever's watching this never has to meet you, um, at least in that regard. But uh, so your book is called I Hope We Never Meet Client Stories of Tragedy recovery and accountability from a life in deterrence law. Uh, can you tell us what the book is about and your inspiration behind writing it? It's a compilation of stories of cases that I've handled, but they are not uh, one on one each paragraph. I think there are nine paragraphs. I'm sorry, chapters uh, and nine chapters. And they are not an individual case study, but what they are is uh, maybe an aggregation of facts of four or five cases that I've handled, and I put them together, change the names, uh, but the core essence of what happened is uh, the cases that I've handled, and uh, each one tells a different story of uh, challenges that my clients faced and how they overcame those challenges, and uh, I intersperse some legal concepts throughout strategically uh, what uh, was accomplished during the course of the litigation or the particular trial. And um, they hopefully uh, inspire people to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And it's a book of hope 
uh, not really tragedy. You know, and, and I really talk about the arc of emotions that people go through during the course of litigation and immediately following a tragedy, um, the, it just changes over time. I, I personally, I mean, I've never had to deal with anything like that, but I like that you said that the book is, is supposed to be a story of hope um, because at the end of each one of those, um, I guess, trials that you've litigated, there's some sort of resolution to something that might be so senseless. Um, but I, I do. So most of our audience obviously is made up of lawyers. Um, and I know that you talk about trial strategies and, and outcomes and things along the way, but what are some other things that attorneys would, would sort of get from reading your book, seeing how uh, you've gone about working with clients who are, who are already dealing with extremely difficult circumstances? I would hope that it might provide a little insight as to how to treat clients, uh, to give a little insight as to uh, what clients are looking for in their representation. Uh, it is not uh, about money from a client's perspective, although many lawyers may think it is. Uh, my experience is that it's always about something other than money. Money happens to be the tool with which we can bring some closure to what's happened to them, but it is not the outcome that anybody is seeking. It is an emotional closure as to what drives them and the outcome that they're seeking and what are the various emotions along the way. And I would hope that attorneys, if they haven't thought through what their clients are facing, not just on an economic perspective, but an emotional perspective, it might uh, provide a little bit of insight as to not just what clients are faced with, but also uh, some potential approaches on how to uh, work with clients in those situations. That's, that's interesting because it's like what other, I mean, we have no other medium of, of providing closure other than money when, when sort of these tragedies happen. Um, well, you know, it's the, the money isn't always the closure. It's the uh, jury verdict. I just finished a case right. yesterday where the jury rendered a verdict and affirmed my client's position that he was um, secure in his belief that he was not uh, the main factor as to what brought about his event, while the defense in the entire defense was blaming him and the we ended up settling it for a substantial amount of money. Um, but uh, there's no doubt in my mind, it's not the money that really will bring him the closure. It was that jury verdict of um, confirming for him uh, what he believed all along. And it was six year litigation during the entire six years. He was being told it was his fault when he truly believed it wasn't. So that uh, component of it is, is, just an important aspect for him to be able to move forward uh, in grappling with what happened to him. I never thought about it like that. Um, yeah. And, totally and right. look, it, 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 the other things I talk about in the book and what I uh, truly believe is really what's our role as attorneys and as counselors, because we are counselors at law, um, is not to make the decisions for our clients. And I talk about this in the book. It is to put our clients in a position so they can make an educated and informed decision. Uh, it's, I always tell clients, hey, this is not my case. And um, when this case is over, I'm on to the next one. But you have to live with the consequences of your decision for the rest of your life. And I my job to make sure you make a smart, informed, educated decision. And as long as you've done that, at that point in time, I've done my job and whatever the outcome is, whatever your decision is, I'm happy to live by it. I think uh, for a lot of the lawyers who watch this, um, who want to follow in your footsteps and really deal with these, these trying cases, right? Um, that it's difficult to know I mean, without your level of experience, how to sort of communicate or provide comfort or, um, or, or like what sort of tone or approach they should take with somebody who's been 
dealing with a significant loss or an injury. Um, so is there anything you did to get better at that part of the job? Or is there any sort of wisdom that you have for somebody who's trying to, to get into this type of, uh, of work? Continue reading, continue investing in yourself, uh, read um, as many books on the topic uh, that you can and understand what it is that drives people's decision-making processes. And uh, that's really, I know, a broad answer, um, but I'll give you a more succinct answer. Be empathetic. Put yourself in their shoes. And uh, that's what I try to do every single time, that if I was the client in this situation, what would I want to hear? And what I would always want to hear is what is the future uh, if I decide A or decide B, because it's really a binary choice for clients. And I try to make it a binary choice. It's either we continue moving forward or I resolve the case. And if we continue moving forward, what does that look like? What does that really mean? What do I have to go through emotionally to see this through? Um, and if I resolve this, what are the um, uh, unfinished emotions I may have to deal with? Um, and am I okay with that? So it's really trying to explain those that binary choice and the road that uh, the binary choice, with the selection of one of those choices takes you down. And I think that if an attorney can do that effectively, then a client is greatly appreciative. Um, and I really don't take ownership of the client's decision. Um, they often want me to, but it's not my decision to make. They have to uh, make that decision uh, on their own. Sometimes they don't feel competent to do so. Um, but that if they don't feel competent to do so, I think that is a reflection on the attorney and not the client. Um, you have to work a little bit harder to, so that they feel competent to make an informed, educated decision. And if you've done that, then uh, they have to own the decision. And then there's nothing and no one that they can blame if the outcome isn't what they had, had hoped. Um, and equally as so, if the outcome is exactly what they had hoped, then they can take all the credit too. We're just, we're simply a vehicle to allow that to happen. Can you, so I'm curious because uh, it seems, and I've spoken to, to plenty of lawyers on this podcast that uh, have said to me on the show recorded that uh, lawyers have an empathy problem because they oftentimes, like what you're saying, they remove themselves and, and they don't take ownership of their client's decision or their outcome or, uh, or anything like that. Um, but you seem more compartmentalized that you actually do empathize with the client and that's why you want to get them a good result. But at the same time, uh, you just try to keep them informed and let them make their own decision. Is there, I don't know, I, I, the strategy is not the word, but how, how do you work on separating your ownership of the, the client's decision and outcome from, from your empathy with them while, while taking on their case? Uh, it's not a bright line uh, separation. Uh, it's there's I get emotionally invested in it as well, and I view my clients as my friends. Um, and in doing so, I tell them how I care about them, what I want to see for them, and really spend time as to what their goals are. And because they themselves don't know and don't understand. Uh, that's what I talk about in the book. They themselves don't understand the pressure that's resting on their shoulders during the course of litigation. And I've seen over and over again, as soon as litigation is over, regardless of the outcome, there's a tremendous relief that is felt um, because it is no longer in their subconscious that what's going to happen. And it's, um, I mean, to go a little bit deeper, what is the emotion that really drives them um, to take make that decision is fear. Um, and the fear of 
whether they choose to go forward or if they choose not to go forward, the fear of making the wrong choice. So a lot of what I do is explain how whatever choice they make, as long as it's an educated and informed choice, then they're making the right choice. Nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody can predict precisely what will happen. We can give our best estimates as to what's likely and what's not likely. Um, and as long as they're comfortable at this moment in time that it's the smart decision for them, then they should never second guess and never make that choice as a result of fear of making the wrong decision because it is the right decision. We will be right back after this short ad. Who doesn't want to be a successful attorney with a busy practice, but still have that life? Having those lunch breaks, playing golf, going on vacation, answering legal allows you to. My name is Laura Pfeiffer Battaloro. I'm an attorney, founding member of the Battaloro Law Group. Our headquarters is in Brooklyn, but we represent people all over the state of New York. The process of getting started with answering legal couldn't have been easier. It was so seamless. They're so efficient, the message will pop up on my phone. It'll pop up in my email. Answering legal allows me to have a personal life, a more balanced life. And it also helps me to be a better attorney. It saves time, it helps you grow your practice without you even realizing it. Getting started with Answering Legal, it's the best thing that we've ever done. It pays off in spades. It's been amazing. I couldn't live without them, <laughs> really. That's a good answer. Um, you can still be emotionally invested, um, but help them make a decision. It makes it makes sense from that standpoint, but uh, it's just it it definitely seems a lot harder than it sounds. Um, it it's definitely hard. It's not. It's not. First of all, you're not trained on this. Um, there are no classes on this. There are no books in the things that I'm talking about. It's through uh, lots of experience and dealing with many, many clients over the years that this evolution of, of the process that I'm describing evolved. Uh, I didn't start this way, that's for sure. So would it be fair to say that that's part of the reason that you started this uh free trial advocacy training uh, for attorneys. I know that uh, teaching lawyers is a passion of yours. Um, so I, A, would it be fair to say that? And, and could you expand on what the school is and, and how it came to be? So a passion of mine definitely is teaching. And uh, a good friend of mine, Richard Newsom, had started this entity called The Trial School. And his approach, I had taught at a previous uh, trial college, really started by trial lawyers, only for trial lawyers. But uh, Rich's um, concept of the trial school, what I liked about it the most is that it draws upon different disciplines within trial work. And when I say disciplines, there are different uh, beliefs on how to actually litigate and try cases. And they are not mutually exclusive. They are, if you can uh, intertwine them, you can be quite effective, but you have to be a student of all of them. And he calls it the mixed martial arts of trial litigation because you're combining different strategies. And um, he, when he was kind of just getting started on it and he asked me to get involved. so. Uh, I did, and we've been quite successful in, in increasing the membership and uh, putting on the programs, but my only qualification for Rich, for me to be involved, was a commitment that it would be for free, that um, I'm not doing it and nobody should be doing it for any reason other than paying it forward, and um, we were able to uh, attract what I think is an all-star group of, of trial lawyers who give programs and it's all on a volunteer basis and nothing's ever, uh, there's no membership fee. It just, you have to, the only way you qualify is 
and you have to certify them. We check and we check every six months that you do only plaintiff's work because, um, frankly, I say things in that um, environment that I would not say on this podcast because it is it is a lot of the secret sauce that we all use throughout our uh, litigation. And um, I think the best way for me to learn is by teaching. That's why I do it. Um, and the more I talk about it and I work with lawyers across the country, um, I'm engaging in self-improvement as well. So it's almost a little bit funny for me to be asking you this because usually I ask uh, somebody who's in your position on this show why they should invest uh, their money in, in a course like yours or uh, their money in a platform like yours. But being that it's free, um, why do you well, feel... Well, I'll, I'll direct you. I'm sorry. But yeah. when you say invest their money, money is fungible. And I don't mean to to uh, be flippant about it, but money is just money. You can make more money tomorrow and going forward. The most valuable thing we all have by far and away is time. That's the thing you don't get back. So if people want to just uh, invest money for the sake of uh, the appearance that they're investing in themselves that's not the true investment by expending money the true investment is the dedication to the time and energy it takes to learn the uh, various skills necessary to uh, try cases in a really smart efficient way um, and that just takes an investment of time and there's nothing more valuable than than that that anybody has uh I couldn't agree with you more. And, uh, and so being, being that we're in agreement about, uh, obviously time being that important, how valuable do you think this type of course would have been to you during your early years as a lawyer? Invaluable. I, I, part of what I teach and go through are all the mistakes I make and they were, um, they were real. I'll just define them as rookie mistakes and those rookie mistakes were made because there was no platform like the trial school. There were no um, books that are, um, that now there's many, many books, but there were, I, if they were out there, I didn't know where they existed when I started practicing. And then in the late nineties, really, I would say starting in about 2005, four or five, Many really accomplished trial lawyers started writing books that um, are really insightful. And if I had access to that information, um, it would have been, I don't know, it would have materially changed my career, but uh, I certainly wouldn't have felt the sting of some of the losses that I had. Um, but that's okay. That's a, a, You learn more uh, from your losses than you do your wins. So... Uh, it was a hard knock education. I'll put it that way. I am very big on always asking for advice and, and trying to get uh, the wisdom of people who have gone before me and made the mistakes. But uh, I do often say that life is the teacher, you know. Um, but since 2020, obviously, with everything going on, we've seen a lot more actual trials, you know, litigation start to take place virtually. Um, as someone who's been participating in trials for a lot of years, uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are, are about the online trial experience. Um, does the convenience of it make it worth it? Or is the virtual nature too restricting for lawyers? So I'm in the minority. Um, I'm, I'm on the executive board of New York State Trial Lawyers when this went, uh, everything went virtual. And I was at the forefront of trying to get the uh, court system to um, participate and sanction uh, virtual trials. And I got a lot of negative feedback from my colleagues, but uh, having done, uh, I do a lot of focus groups. I've done hundreds and uh, I was already doing focus groups online that it is a different skill set and a different presentation necessary, but I believe you get as good, if not a better result, 
during a um, virtual trial. Uh, although in New York, they don't exist, but I, I definitely did some mock virtual trials. Um, but I believe that they are more efficient and better than uh, often in-person trials because it puts a tremendous amount of pressure on the trial lawyer to be really efficient and um, prepared because if you're not prepared, you're not going to do well in a virtual trial. But if you are very prepared and know exactly the line of the, that you're going to take and the theme and, and have a throughput from uh, your jury selection right on through to your summation, it could be very, very effective because you have the ability to truly direct jurors' attention to exactly what you want through the use of technology. And that um, is very hard to do in a courtroom. I just literally resolved a case yesterday after three weeks of trial. And uh, it was not nearly as easy to keep their attention on what I wanted their attention on in the courtroom as opposed to on a computer screen. I've never even thought about that aspect of, uh, of trials. Obviously I wouldn't have to, but yeah, if I'm in person, there's, there's daydream, but uh, there's something about the immediacy of uh, it's more one-on-one -on -one instead of a room full of people. Um, especially like what you're saying when it comes to a jury um, and the, and the counselor uh, it, it's, it's, I'm, I'm in an empty room right now, you know? Um, so for me, I think uh, you've captured my attention more than you would say if I opened the door and my office was full of people walking by and, and, and there were noises and things happening outside. So, and there's a court and there's a court officer there, their radio goes off and then somebody walks into the courtroom and then you have a stenographer who's moving around and, and all of those um, minor distractions add up where you don't have, we have a finite amount of cognitive attention that we can provide. And anything that sucks away from that cognitive attention uh, is meaning that the individual and you is not paying full attention to you or the words that you're using and your um, ability to be persuasive is diminished. And I don't think that that um, um, is as apparent on a, a virtual trial. That's not to suggest that people don't have distractions uh, sitting in their home, but they are not new distractions. They are not, um, they're not in a new environment. They're not in a courtroom. They're not being escorted in and out by a court officer. They're not wondering where they have to sit. They're not, they're, there's, there are a lot of distractions that take away from the opportunity for a lawyer to be persuasive. In a, but I, that's not to say I would take uh, virtual trials over in-person trials all the time. I am, my position, and I still believe this, is that um, you can get as good a result with a virtual trial as you can an in-person trial. I think that's, really what it, and that's really what it's all about. What's the outcome going to be? I think it's also an accessibility thing, too. Um, don't make people travel as far, especially if they can't. Um, and. Uh, I don't have to get into all that. You're obviously much more versed in that topic than I am. Um, but I do want to let our listeners know. So where can anybody who's watching this or, or listening to this purchase your book? And where can they go to get started with your trial school? Well, the book is Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any online uh, bookseller. They can purchase it. And the trial school is trialschool.org. Easy. And um, yeah, very easy. So, Andrew, I'd like to uh, not waste any more of your time, your your valuable time. Uh, but I, I really I appreciate your time today. I, I, I want to thank you so much for joining me. Um, thank you to all of our listeners. We hope you enjoyed this conversation and we'll be back with another episode of Everything Except the Law soon. Be sure to check out previous episodes of our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, the Answering Legal YouTube channel, and of course, everything, uh, the trial school and, uh, and Andrew's book will be linked in the description. See you next time, everyone.